Hello everybody, uh, my name is Jens Meiler. I am a professor here at Vanderbilt University and also at Leipzig University in Germany. And I'm one of the co-creators of the Rosetta software. And it's my pleasure today to welcome you to this um, workshop, which will introduce you into the basics of the software and help you to get started running your own calculations in this software. Now, Rosetta is an academic software project. It is very large and very complex. So um, there is a quite substantial learning curve associated with it. And in this week, we will only be able to um, lay the very first foundations. After this workshop is over, I'm sure you're going to have additional questions and at least some time and possibly also help from experts to design the computational protocols you need to address your research questions of interest. Um, so after this workshop, please do not hesitate to contact us. We can put you in uh, uh, contact with the experts in the um, Rosetta community that can help you to address your questions of research. Um, I also would like to give a shout out to Rocco Moretti and the students and postdocs in my laboratory who put these teaching materials together. Please keep in mind that uh, all of them did that on their own free time um, for you. And if something is not 100% perfect, then uh, um, remember that uh, um, we are not professionals in producing this material. It's the first time that we do the workshop workshop um, online and so uh, we hope that you guys will um, enjoy it. So um, let's get started and my talk today is really just an introduction to um, some aspects of Rosetta with a focus to some of the protocols that you're gonna uh, see um, uh, this week. Uh, this introduction is meant by no way to be in no way to be comprehensive. It's really just um, uh, uh, illustrating some of the fundamental concepts um, that went into the design of this uh, of this software and um, make you familiar with some of the strengths that Rosetta has and mention some of the some of the weaknesses. So I've talked I've called this talk the inverse protein folding problem, um, uh, and you will um, uh, realize in a second what I mean with that. Um, we're going to talk about protein folding simulations as well as protein engineering uh, and sometimes these problems are um, uh, in, in many ways these problems are related and this is what we're gonna uh, learn today and that's one of the fundamental ideas Rosetta was uh, designed around. Now um, from these fundamental ideas that we're gonna talk about mostly today um, Rosetta has grown to include a very large number of um, modes where you can run different uh, simulations of your uh, uh, biomolecular modeling uh, uh, suite. I tried to move this a little bit so that the uh, slides are better, uh, easier to see. And so it became a framework for uh, molecular modeling that includes not just protein folding, or comparative modeling, it also includes small molecule docking or RNA folding, protein design we will talk about, but also looking at protein-protein interactions through docking, but also through engineering those interactions. So it's a very, very versatile tool. And um, one of the things we will discuss this week a little bit is that one of the underlying hypotheses is that by requiring more or less one energy function to do well in this uh, very wide set of tasks, we will get a versatile energy function that, that is a very good energy function. You know, um, nature you know, uses free energy to determine whether or not a particular structure of a protein is stable. We cannot calculate uh, free energy accurately in the computer. We have to estimate it. So we have to take a lot of shortcuts in order to estimate it in a short period of time. And um, a lot of our research goes into, you know, optimizing uh, this energy function and finding what shortcuts are acceptable. 
And one of the strengths of the Rosetta community is that this energy function gets tested on this wide variety of tasks so that you immediately notice if you take a shortcut that might be acceptable for push and folding, but it's not good for design, then it would not be applied. And overall, this sort of um, uh, um, collective optimization of uh, energy function to do well on all of these tasks is really uh, something that makes the Rosetta energy functions one of the very best and very fa and fastest energy functions out there for evaluating protein structure and protein interactions with other, with other molecules. Now, um, let me go on and say that the Rosetta community has grown to around 100 laboratories worldwide who signed up to just develop that software. There are tens of thousands of academic licenses out there. Um, here I uh, show you pictures of uh, some of the other co-creators of this Rosetta software and how they are distributed um, over the United States uh, for the most part, but also in Europe um, uh, for some of them. And um, uh, this uh, uh, Rosetta Commons that we created, that um, you know, team of 100 laboratories worldwide developing collectively Rosetta is another strength of that software. That is really, it means we have all the time innovative new ideas that people put into the code and make it available to a large research community. So the software is developing very rapidly in very innovative ways. And um, this is also one of the reasons why it's not that easy to learn the software because uh, there are a lot of different ways to use it and uh, there are uh, uh, changes ongoing all, all the time. Now, uh, here's a picture from a few years back um, as an annual meeting of the community. Uh, meanwhile, the community is so big that not even everybody can attend, but um, uh, you see here some of the people who in a day-to-day -day, uh, basis develop Rosetta and its affiliated programs like the Python interface or the folded game that you might have heard about. Um, and uh, this vibrant and dynamic uh, community is really um, uh, supporting uh, Rosetta and one reason for many uh, students and postdocs to, to, uh, to, to join us. So, uh, but let's get started with some of the fundamental concepts behind the software. And uh, here is the um, protein uh, folding problem and the inverse protein folding problem um, sort of highlighted on, um, on one slide. Um, so the folding problem, to state it uh, very in a very simple way, is um, you know, given an amino acid sequence, can you tell me the, the tertiary structure of the protein or possibly even the quaternary structure? And this is a this is not an easy this is not an easy pro, uh, problem computationally. Um, you know, given an amino acid sequence um, of let's say just a hundred amino acids, that would be a small protein. And let's assume each of these amino acids can adopt a hundred conformations, which is you know reasonable for a small organic molecule like an amino acid. That would give us ten to the power of two hundred possible combinations there are. Um, and um, this is an insanely large number. Um, you know, even even nature, if you if, if all of these rotatable bonds would uh, be could be sampled at, at a very high frequency, it would you know still take uh, you know if you could sample uh, ten to the fourteen or ten to the sixteen of those per second, uh, which is sort of the bond rotation that you can achieve. Um, that would still take 10 to the 184 seconds to fold the protein. That's longer than work exists, right? So protein folding does in nature not work by exhaustive sampling, and you sure cannot write a computer algorithm that does exhaustive sampling. It's just far too a large confirmation of space. And, um, you know, uh, Leventhal formulated that paradox in 1968. And um, we obviously know that uh, uh, that nature doesn't approach protein folding that way. It has a guidance that tells you which conformational change is good, namely the one that minimizes the energy. And so um, similarly, if you want to write a computer program, um, you better have an energy function 
and then uh, take uh, uh, caution in your code that you sample conformations that are likely to have a low energy. And so if we um, go on here and formulate the inverse protein folding problem, then that would be given a protein tertiary structure, um, which sequence will fold into that structure. And that's also not an easy problem. If you have a protein of a 100 amino acids with a well-defined fold and you ask which sequence folds into that protein, then um, you um, would need to consider in each position each of the 20 natural amino, uh, naturally or genetically encoded amino acids at least. Um, you could possibly also consider non-natural amino acids before that, but let's stay with uh, the 20 uh, um, uh, naturally encoded. And then uh, let's assume each of them can have a number of conformations for just the side chain. So let's assume 100 side chain conformations total. That's rather small. And then you're back at this number of 10 to the power 200 or so uh, conformations that you would have to sample. And so um, uh, this all cannot be done exhaustively. And one of the big uh, uh, questions in Rosetta and other softwares is, you know, which kind of algorithm do you use to sample these large conformational spaces um, efficiently? So um, let's start into looking uh, how Rosetta approaches these problems. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the novo folding. Uh, so just the Rosetta folding simulation without any experimental data. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about high-resolution refinement, okay, how you add atomic detail to these structures in Rosetta. Um, and then I uh, focus on uh, modeling with sparse and low-resolution experimental data, which is one of the strengths of Rosetta, before we go over to the inverse protein folding problem, uh, which deals with engineering proteins. Well, I might skip some slides just to stay within a reasonable uh, uh, time frame for this presentation. Um, and I will let you know, but we will upload the whole presentation. So um, the novel protein folding uh, and the critical assessment of uh, techniques for protein structure prediction, or CASP. Um, so um, Rosetta approaches the protein folding problem in uh, two um, uh, fundamental approaches. The first approach is in order to reduce the conformational space to, that needs to be sampled, we limit ourselves to conformations of peptides that have been observed in other proteins in nature. So um, you take your amino acid sequence of interest, you predict secondary structure with a tool like Cypred or Chufo, um, and then you chop that sequence into uh, fragments of nine residues that are overlapping, so one to uh, nine, two to 10, and so on and so forth. And now you go to the protein data bank, a database of experimental structures of proteins that you know, contain um, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of protein structures, and you find um, uh, peptides in proteins, uh, and uh, similar peptides, so peptides similar in sequence and in secondary structure um, uh, compared to your you know, target protein of interest. And for each position in your target protein, you assemble a database of um, uh, 20, uh, actually 200, but uh, later the top 20 of those are used more extensively, um, fragments. And um, we assume that these, this conformational space embodied in these 200 fragments is actually um, describing the conformational space accessible or possibly accessible to this peptide. With nine residues, we, you won't have a perfect amino acid match. So they're going to be, you know, four, five, six residues that are going to be identical with some mutations. Um, but this um, local sequence bias will substantially reduce uh, the conformational space that uh, needs to be sampled. Now, um, uh, it also has the advantage that many of the local interactions are actually already um, uh, close to perfect because they have been observed in high-resolution crystal structure. In that sense, um, it's a little bit uh, misleading if you call uh, it, um, uh, uh, you know, the novel folding, and we need the novel folding because you actually use quite a bit of uh, um, uh, conformational information from other proteins. So 
uh, if you want, it's, you could also call it a comparative modeling from an insanely large amount, a number of templates. But that's the fundamental idea uh, in order to reduce the conformational space. And secondly, to rapidly sample that conformational space, there is a Monte Carlo algorithm that can recombine these fragments, uh, at random positions, pick a different fragment, change the conformation rapidly in the large step. And then there is an energy function uh, that very rapidly evaluates, is this a nightly low energy arrangement? So make sure we don't have any clashes for soluble protein or hydrophobic amino acids in the core or hydrophilic amino acids exposed. Um, the pairwise interactions, the residues that come close in space, does this make sense? Um, do better strands come together to form sheets? They should not be alone. Um, Overall, is the protein compact uh, in order to, you know, uh, give the aqueous solution, the water around it, most freedom to move and maximize its entropy. And all of these, all of these terms uh, go into an energy function, and that is the low resolution energy function of Rosetta that we can compute very rapidly. Uh, side chain conformations are not sampled in that uh, energy function. The side chain is represented with basically a super atom, a centroid, one large atom, or the size of the atom depends on the size of the side chain. Um, and this makes this energy function rapid enough to sample conformational space. And um, unfortunately, this energy function is also very imprecise. So it uh, loses the ability to distinguish the correctly folded protein from alternatives. So basically, the free energy minimum, which I you know, draw in red here, is, um, is, is, is uh, uh, obscured, it's not as deep as it, as it should be. Um, um, and uh, on top of this, the conformational space is still very large. So a single calculation will not find even whatever the lowest energy minimum is. So you run the simulation um, um, thousands of times, and then you cluster this, and what you do is you look for particularly large clusters, because the hypothesis being that the width of these energy minima is less perturbed, and a very deep energy minimum has, is also very wide, and therefore large, uh, wide energy minima are more likely to represent the native fault, and so we need to look for large clusters. And this works um, you know, reasonably well. Um, when I say reasonably well, you know, um, for proteins up to about 150 um, uh, um, uh, residues, one of the five largest clusters will be reasonably close to the native um, in about half of the cases. So a lot of uh, whens and ifs. Uh, protein folding remains an unsolved problem. Uh, Rosetta is just one of the tools that uh, made uh, great strides uh, towards um, um, you know, making progress in that field. And so if you put this all together, then you have sort of in a nutshell how the Rosetta algorithm works. Obviously, it's much more uh, complicated than that if you look into the details. Just to show you here, um, uh, these original publications are around the year uh, 2000, so a little bit more than 20 years ago. Um, and here is um, a simulation, uh, a little video that sort of shows one of those folding simulations to give you a better idea. Starts from an extended chain. Um, I uh, have the uh, uh, secondary structure elements um, labeled so that we see early on um, where the alpha helices and where the beta strands are. And then um, I also colored the chain in rainbow so that we see the N terminus in blue and the uh, C terminus in red. And once in a while you see a gray structure pop up. That's the experimental structure of this protein. This is ubiquitin. This is a 76 residue small protein uh, that was at the folds quite successfully. And uh, we do see here why. So let me go back and just um, uh, rerun the simulation so that. Um, uh, you can appreciate some of the things that I mentioned. So here again is uh, this video. There is the crystal structure. And now we see that with just a few fragments thrown in, the alpha helix is formed, right? A few, two or three fragments in that region that are helical will form the alpha helix. 
the better strands are more difficult. First, we see this better hairpin in blue, which is a local contact, some local hydrogen bonds to connect the backbone. But then this uh, C-terminal uh, orange strand needs much more time to find its place because it makes these non-local hydrogen bonds with uh, other strands in the structure. And it's more difficult to find those and even with the Monte Carlo sampling algorithm. So non-local contacts tend to be made later in the folding simulations. Um, and the more of these non-local contacts you have, uh, the harder it is actually for Rosetta to fold your protein. And that's an exciting study that shows that this actually correlates with folding rates in nature. And nature also, uh, small proteins with more complex topologies uh, fold uh, more, uh, more slowly. So uh, let me see if we can go on here. So um, major challenges are these uh, complex topologies, as I just mentioned. Um, major uh, challenges are also converting these models that have only these uh, backbone atoms in the centroids to full atom models that place accurately each atom. And um, we will talk a little bit how these two challenges are best approached. So um, I mentioned CASP here. Um, since CASP 3, um, uh, the, uh, you know, Rosetta has really played um, a significant role in shaping that ex uh, this uh, experiment. This is a protein structure prediction um, comparison. So, um, sequences of proteins with unknown structure are sent to all participating labs. You predict a uh, structure, send it back, and then uh, 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 as the structures get published, um, we compare those predictions to uh, the data. So it's a blind experiment of protein folding. Obviously, you select proteins where uh, you have some indication from an experimental group that the structure is forthcoming. Um, and um, uh, uh, this has been tremendously important for the field because it sort of provided an unbiased blind evaluation of these algorithms and made the algorithms uh, much, uh, much stronger. So here are some examples uh, just to give you a realistic idea how this looks like. Left is the experimental structure for this protein target 135 out of the CASP experiment many years ago, but I made that prediction myself, so I'd like to show it. And here is uh, our, our model for this particular protein. So um, let's talk first about adding sidechain. Um, and um, how do you sample sidechain conformations? And again, Rosetta uses in principle the same idea um, as we use for backbone. For backbone, we build this library for every protein, for every peptide. What are the most similar peptides in the protein data bank? Well, sidechains are even easier. I have 20 genetically encoded sidechains. So I can just build a library of likely conformations for these sidechains. Um, you know, having the backbone fixed, I have sidechain angles, chi1, chi2, chi3, chi4. That's sort of the maximum in lysine or arginine. Most residues have two, like uh, here we see a superimposition of aspartates from the crystallographic database. Here's the C-alpha, nitrogen, carbonyl. And then we see beta, and you see there are these two angles that get varied. And um, um, we, you can build a library of uh, likely conformations, and that's precisely what uh, Rosetta uses. So here is a um, simple example where we can get easily understand that serine has just one side chain that uh, can be uh, rotated, the chi1 angle between the C alpha and the C beta. And you can do a statistics that shows you what you would expect as a chemist, 60 degrees, 180 degrees, 300 degrees are uh, the energetically more, most preferred. But from the statistics, you can learn a little bit more. You see that 60 degree is more preferred than the other two. You also see it's not precisely 60, that's a small, small offsets. And you also see a lift. So you see sort of a tolerance that nature has. So all of these things are gonna go into, uh, into, into Rotomer libraries. Rosetta uses the ones uh, that are developed by in Roland Vandenberg's group. So um, uh, here is an example how such a Rotomer library could look like, um, where you have three possible states for serine to be in, and you have the average angle, the standard deviation, the probability, 
And then if you have an amino acid with more uh, angles, like tryptophan, you will have more states, in this case, nine, for example. And so uh, with this library now, it becomes very simple to sample sidechain conformations because you can go in and just you know, swap out tryptophan from, from one rotomer to another. And you also see with tryptophan, you might want to start with rotomer 3.3 because that's 30% of what uh, tryptophan does. And then you try the other ones that are high and maybe one, two or something that you only try if none of the other one fits. And so um, Rosetta again uses a uh, Monte Carlo search to search these conformations. And an energy function that is um, Again, uh, looking at uh, the terms that you would expect, uh, flashes, solvation, when the, ball, when the balls interaction, hydrogen bonds. Just now, the energy function is at a higher level of resolution. It uses all the atoms and not these centuries. Um, and uh, here we see, again, a little a movie that sort of illustrates that just in the core of this protein, Gray was the crystal structure. And here we see a sampling of sidechain conformations. Um, and you see that in the end, this algorithm achieves a conformation that is reasonably close to the experimental structure. So that's one caveat with what I just um, uh, uh, told you, which is, um, you know, I showed you early on uh, that um, even if Rosetta predicts the correct fold, there are observable deviations in the precise placement of the backbone from the experimental structures. And now I showed you if I have the backbone precise, then I can place the side chains. So if you want to stitch these two protocols together, um, you uh, will not achieve immediate success because the backbone is not correctly placed to add all the side chains. And so uh, many of us at our papers implement an iterative protocol. We call it sometimes the lex, sometimes it's something uh, it's, it's, it's tailored to your particular application and called it a little bit differently. But if you read the papers carefully, you will recognize this theme where you have a random perturbation of the backbone fragment replacement or in another way an optimization. A fast optimization of side chains using this automer representation that I just showed and then a gradient based minimization that can move all the atoms and then you continue with modifying your backbone and you iteratively run this cycle in order to optimize backbone and side chain conformation simultaneously. So um, this protocol uh, showed some of his first successes in CASP-6. So here's a target that um, uh, we predicted at the time, a very small protein. And um, the crystal structure is in this salmon color. Uh, the model that uh, we submitted is in blue. And you do see for the first time that not only the backbone is placed pretty precisely, but the, some of the side chains are correctly oriented. And so um, uh, Phil Bradley, in the lab at the time, uh, moved on and benchmarked that. He took a bunch of small proteins and saw, can we predict side chain uh, conformations um, accurately on top of the backbone? And, you know, for some proteins that work quite well, um, uh, we will see this week a lot of these plots where we have Rosetta energy on the y-axis. This is root mean square deviation on the x-axis. So zero would be you hit the experimental structure. The blue dots are if you take the experimental structure and run it through this iterative cycle that I just showed you. So it's just looking what's the closest Rosetta energy minimum to the experimental structure. And you see it goes down to minus 200 and at a half an angstrom or something like that. The black dots are Rosetta models where the side chains have been added and then underwent this iterative cycle. And you see um, you can pick by energy a model that is about one angstrom away from the native. So that's really good. But you also see there's still a gap between the native energy in Rosetta and the best model we get with the Nova folding. For other proteins like this one, it looks nicer in the sense that you have sort of a continuous energy landscape going down to um, this native structure. We also call this an energy funnel. 
as I mentioned, this is an unsolved problem. Now this paper is a few years old, but uh, um, uh, nothing tremendous changed there. It remains uh, uh, a challenge to predict a structure at high resolution for a protein. Uh, here we see uh, 16 proteins of very short proteins as a test case. And um, some of them achieve uh, almost D values below one and a half mean squared. So five out of the 16 here. Good. Um, with that, I want to uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about um, this bonoma folding and placing the backbone. I mentioned even for you know small proteins less than 150 residues, that does not work uh, often. So it's a very academic kind of question. So uh, a more interesting question is actually a um, more interesting approach is to combine all that with experimental data. And this is really one of the largest applications of Rosetta. Um, and here the notion is um, that, you know, if you have a rich experimental data set, so, you know, you have a crystal that reflects to 1.5 angstrom and you know the phases, uh, then you get an electron density map where you can very precisely place every atom, right? And that then you don't need towards that. There are not enough softwares that build good structures into those density maps. Um, if you have a small soluble protein and you do, do nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, you know, similar, you have um, maybe uh, 20 NOEs, 20 distance restraints per amino acid, and you can basically nail the position of more or less every atom. However, um, uh, this case where you have a pretty focused um, you know, small ensemble that is consistent with your data is, um, is rare. If we consider this huge conformational space of a protein that I labeled here in, with this rectangle, you know, often for the proteins that interest it, we have only limited experimental data. It could be a density map at a lower resolution from crystallography or from electron microscopy or from other sources could be sparse NMR data sets, could be, you know, data from mass spectrometry, from electron power magnetic resonance from, you know, other sources. And so uh, the hypothesis here is that um, with this local sequence bias, focusing us on likely conformations of backbone that we have seen in other proteins, and with this energy function, asking is our model biophysically realistic? The hope is that in many cases we can constrain that back to the correct uh, conformation. And let me show a few examples uh, here, um, and you will see in those examples that, again, this iterative loop uh, to optimize the protein conformation will be uh, uh, important. So um, this is a paper, um, 2007, <clears throat> that uh, tested Rosetta's ability to optimize these, uh, these structures um, to atomic detail accuracy. And this has something to do with the crystallographic phase problem. And, you know, some of you know this problem, others might, might not know it. I don't have the time to go into too much detail, but uh, in, in two sentences, um, uh, if you do an X-ray experiment, if you have a crystal of a protein, you don't get directly a density map you get the fraction pattern. And to translate that into an electron density map, you need to know the phases. And the, uh, determining those phases is known as the crystallographic phase problem. One way to solve that is to have a really, really good model. If you have a model of your protein that is very accurate, you can determine the phases. And um, uh, here we compare uh, structures determined by nuclear magnetic resonance comparative models of the proteins and the novel model of the protein to models that have been refined with this iterative process, process of Rosetta and ask, does this optimization of the structure in Rosetta improve the uh, phases and thus the density maps that you observe? And so this is a table with the results. I just want to focus on uh, these two slides that come now. Uh, and again, we're only going to focus on, on few aspects of this. So um, if you um, look at this, we have the native structure in blue, the starting model in red, and then green is the Rosetta refined structure. And you see in some regions, it 
moves from the red starting point towards blue, improving, improving the structure. And this is true for refinement of NMR structures up here, as well as refinement of comparative models further down here. And now if you use these models to determine the, the phases, I'm sorry, um, then uh, you can compare here on the left side if you use the NMR structure as is, and on the right side if you ref refine and relax it within Rosetta Plus. Or here a comparative model as is, and then in, in its energy optimized and resampled with Rosetta. And so this is sort of indicating that we add atomic detail to these models um, in a way that makes it very precise and improves uh, the phases that we can determine when we combine it with those densities maps. Um, I mentioned nuclear magnetic resonance, the second approach uh, to determine high resolution structures of proteins. Um, again, if you are an expert, you will recognize some of the things I'm saying. If you're not an expert, we won't have the time to go into detail. But in a nutshell, it's a spectroscopy. We're going to have resonance frequencies for every atom. So one of the biggest challenges is assigning all of these resonance frequencies. Uh, these resonance frequencies are called chemical shifts in um, uh, NMR because uh, the actual precise resonance frequency depends on the chemical environment of the nucleus. There are overhauser enhancement, nuclear overhauser enhancement, enhancement effects, so we've called NOEs, which are dipolar interactions between these nuclear spins. And they are distant dependent, so you can actually measure distance through space, but only very short distances, up to six angstrom or so. Um, and then uh, there are many other parameters. One that is pretty uh, popular right now, also called residual dipolar couplings, which tell you something about the orientation of uh, secondary structure elements, for example. Again, NMR is a very large field with a lot of other exciting things going on. This is really uh, the, the basics of the basics, but um, I just want to um, um, show you um, uh, a few highlights that show Rosetta's ability when combined with nuclear magnetic resonance. I mentioned assignment of all of these resonance frequencies to the atoms is a huge challenge when the protein gets large in particular. Um, for a number of reasons, more frequencies to assign, but also the spectra get, uh, the resolution of the spectra gets somewhat worse. And so often you can only assign the atoms in the backbone and not in the side chains. And that reduces the number of restraints and we get into this sparse setting that I mentioned. And so one of the uh, exciting uh, um, uh, developments is combine uh, Rosetta with these uh, sparse backbone only data sets. And um, here um, one uh, can basically uh, see um, on the x-axis RMSD how accurate these models are and on the y-axis distributions when we only use chemical shifts of the backbone or if we use chemical shifts and residual dipolar couplings. Uh, if you don't assign the side chains, you have very few NOEs. Um, and, um, uh, you see here that even with just chemical shift and RDC data, Rosetta is capable of building good models. So let me show you some of those here. Superimposition of um, the Rosetta predicted structure from backbone only data in red and the NMR, the traditionally NMR derived ensembles from all data in blue. And you see um, uh, uh, a very nice agreement here. Or in this figure, you know, this works for proteins up to maybe about 250 residues or so. So these can be quite substantial proteins. And you see here all of these rounds of iterative refinement, um, um, so starting from the blue color, going to the red color, the, um, you know, these are rounds of refinement of top each, of each other, first low resolution, then in high resolution. You really sort of see this energy funnel that pulls you towards um, the free angstrom RMSD that we see here, which for a protein of this size is a very accurate prediction. Um, or another example is electron power magnetic resonance, which is a uh, sister or part of NMR, if you like. Um, so you use an unpaired electron, or often two unpaired electrons, to measure their dipolar coupling, similar to an NOE. However, um, 
uh, uh, you can measure much longer distances, up to 60 angstrom or so. And again, this is a glimpse into EPR. There's a whole lot of exciting things going on in the structural biology of EPR. But this experiment, uh, also called PR experiment, is really very popular these days to probe the structure of proteins in particular, if you, because you can apply it to very large proteins, you can measure long distances, and you can observe them in their native environment. In EPR, it's, uh, you don't have to assign the signals, you know which amino acids are labeled, but you need to put in this an uh, unpaired electron. And so this is a chemical modification. You often start from a cysteine reacted with a chemical MSTL, which has uh, this unpaired electron built in. And then if you do that two cysteines, then you can measure that distance. Again, there's a lot of um, uh, literature to read up if you are interested in that, that I won't go into. Uh, one of the challenges is that um, if you want to determine the structure of a protein, the spin label is very dynamic. So um, the actual distance that you measure is not one precise distance, it's a distribution of distances. And you have to translate that back into sort of a C beta, C beta distance that uh, you really um, you know, can use to predict the structure. And there have been a number of methods proposed for that. Um, this is a benchmark we did for a T4 lysozyme, a you know, well-known protein with a well-known structure. Um, these uh, distances indicated by red dots were measured. So the average distance measured is the blue dot. The blue bar is sort of the distribution showing, each, showing you the uncertainty that comes from the spin label mo movement. The red bar is the backbone distance in the crystal structure. And you see this, you know, for residue 140 to 151, the distance is somewhere between 0 and 30 angstrom. So that's definitely a sparse, low resolution restraint. And we had 25 of those. So if we, if we run Rosetta as it is, let's focus on the left-hand side here, root mean square deviation count of models. Without experimental data, the best models Rosetta makes are here four and a half, five angstrom, and then you know, most of them are around 15 and 16 angstrom. We don't see that here. Once you add these 25 restraints that just limit in a very soft way the distance between some of these atoms, you see what happens. You shift that distribution over substantially towards the correct fold, and you get some models that really um, go down to two and a half, three angstrom. And now you can go on, add the side chain to these models, and run this iterative loop um, to confirm and optimize the, the structure and the interactions. And then you have here Rosetta energy on the y-axis, root mean square deviation on the x-axis, native relax, and you get models down at about one angstrom that are very close in energy to the native structure. And that also, and as shown on the right-hand side, have most of the side chains correctly positioned. And this is here on the visual or now you see in the core of the proteins. So many of those side chains are accurately in the, in the correct rotomer and the correct conformation. So um, these are sort of some of the examples of using Rosetta with uh, limited experimental data. Um, this is, again, by no means comprehensive. Rosetta has been combined with uh, limited experimental data from many different sources. Um, uh, and uh, you can go out and, and do a literature search to identify some of those papers. Um, and see if your favorite uh, method uh, to collect structural information for a protein is there. I want to switch gears a little bit and use the last, you know, 15 minutes or so to talk about uh, protein design. And we start with a classic TOP7. TOP7 um, is a protein that has been engineered with Rosetta. And again, we call this the inverse protein folding problem where we start from a structure and we ask which sequence will fold into that structure. Um, now, how does this design calculation run? It's very similar to the packing simulation I showed you earlier, but instead of sampling just conformations of one genetically encoded amino acid in each position, we actually sample uh, conformations of all 20 naturally encoded amino acids in each position. I show this here just for the core of the protein. Um, to make it you know, bearable for the human eye. Um, you do see that um, these uh, 
uh, Rosetta samples very hydrophobic cores. Now I turned on that it shows us some of the steps that are rejected that the energy function doesn't like. And you saw it also looks at very hydrophilic cores. But in the end, this algorithm settles on a core that is actually very hydrophobic and in sequence and conformation very close to uh, the native structure. Now, the protein I'm showing you here is actually top seven. So top seven is a protein that has a five-stranded sheet. Um, see this here with these hexagons. And then we have two alpha helices. So we start, we start with a, a strand, go into another strand, go into an alpha helix, another strand, another alpha helix, and then two more strands. This topology had not been observed in the protein data bank at the time the study was done. And so um, uh, Brian Kuhlman um, uh, and Gautam Dantas actually send out, set out to ask the question, can we engineer a protein fold that is new, that has not yet been observed in nature? They placed these uh, better strands and alpha helices in the approximate conformation they would want to accomplish and then started this iterative process of designing the sequence and uh, optimizing the structure. This is also not perfect. This does not always work. If you read the papers carefully, there are always uh, designs that, that uh, if you want to test them experimentally, that don't work out. Top 7 is also called top 7 and not top 1 for a reason. There have been several rounds that were uh, not successful or only partially successful. But uh, for top 7, ultimately, the crystal structure was determined. And it's a well-behaving protein that folds cooperatively. And if you look at the crystal structure here, you see it's uh, really well resolved and stable. And you can now compare the crystallographic data with what has been designed in the first place. And you see that generally uh, the RMSD is below one angstrom. Most of the side chains are in a water mirror that we would expect. There's this one loop region which is slightly in a different conformation. Other than that, um, it really matches uh, the prediction. And that's sort of um, a hallmark of a successful design that you obviously don't know before. But uh, if you are able to determine the structure and it is correct, then it's very accurate. Um, and uh, meanwhile, Rosetta has really been used to design protein, protein interfaces, design enzyme, design, uh, you know, um, all sorts of um, uh, uh, new machines that, you know, self-assemble into particles. And, and so they are really, really exciting, uh, uh, for sure, 30 to 40 uh, uh, publications out there that sort of, uh, uh, show us uh, some of uh, some very exciting um, uh, engineering um, um, challenges that have been tackled successfully with Rosetta. So with that, I show you uh, a last story from uh, my own group for engineering, um, and this is a computational designed uh, Tim barrel protein, um, and uh, we set out with um, you know a particular uh, question um, which came from. Uh, the symmetry that we see in a lot of superfolds. So nature reuses folds, and there are about 10 folds that are really heavily reused, and about half of those are more symmetric. And so one of the old hypotheses is that these symmetric folds could have evolved through uh, gene duplication and fusion, where you basically so first optimize a half protein and then put the two halves together once you duplicate the genes and fuse them. And that would accelerate evolution um, substantially. And so one of the proteins that has been studied in this respect is HIS-F. Um, and uh, this uh, HIS-F protein out of the histidine synthesis pathway is um, uh, pretty, pretty symmetric if you look at it in the first place. It's one of the most symmetric structures that you could find in the PDB. And the Stürmer lab uh, did some really fundamental research. They took the N and the C-terminal half of this proteins, concatenated it, so they have a HIS-FC, HIS-FC, and HIS-FN, HIS-FN, and they looked at um, how this protein behaves. And um, uh, they, it wasn't the home one, uh, but they found proteins that sort of behaved reasonably. And so um, uh, they did that mostly by experience looking at the structures, being experts and recognizing some of the similarities. So when I saw that study, 
I thought, oh, this is something one could try with Rosetta. Why not um, create all possible symmetric versions of this protein in the computer and just find the one that by structure and sequence is the most stable. And that's what we did. So we took the crystal structure, superimposed it with itself, 180 degrees rotated, and then created symmetric backbones, jumping sort of from blue to from cyan to green and back, and then uh, designed that and asked which sequences are the most stable. And um, without going into, into um, you know, the details of, of this particular project, what was exciting is that um, we ended up with 62 flavors of the backbone and the Rosetta energy on the y-axis here, it's normalized by the number of amino acids, um, you see is actually varying. And you have this region here where the energy is lowest. So we decided to create this protein with the lowest energy here and look at it. And so in the computer, it looks perfectly, it's now perfectly symmetric. You see, this is duplicated. Um, this is the Rosetta energy plotted per residue. And you see this protein is happy. It's a low energy for um, uh, all important regions. Um, and then we went ahead and, um, sorry, let me delete the slides, and uh, uh, you know, express the protein. And um, here we comp compare the starting material is F. Um, we call this protein FLR. And then we also express just half of this protein because it should spontaneously assemble. And if you look at the uh, secondary structure in the CD, you see half FLR and FLR have a very similar CD spectrum. His F is slightly different, but this, the reason is that we changed the beta strand content. We duplicated this loop, which has a better hairpin, and so we have just a little bit more better strand. It folds and unfolds in a corporative fashion, and um, uh, even the signature in this um, uh, uh, CD spe spectrum, in the near UV CD spectrum, is uh, very similar, suggesting that the tryptophan, uh, that it has one tryptophan which will dominate the spectrum, and suggesting that it's in a similar sort of packing uh, to the his F wild type. And then we were able to determine the crystal structure. And you see that, again, a lot of the details are correctly predicted. So the classic situation, if your design works, it works perfectly and you get uh, all of the atoms correctly uh, placed. This is looking at a helix-helix interface. And then if you go to the core, here's this tryptophan, which gives the signature in your uh, UVCD. OK, and so. Um, to some extent, we created here a, a sort of a hypothetical missing link in evolution where we uh, created this um, half uh, barrel that if its gene were to be duplicated and fused, could spontaneously fold into a full barrel. Um, with that, I uh, just summarized, I showed you that we can fold sometimes proteins up to 150 residues. Uh, we can add side chains without any experimental data for very small proteins up to say 80 amino acids. This all becomes very powerful if you add experimental data, which is one of the major applications in Rosetta. And I showed you uh, the Milbo design for top seven and then for this uh, sequence symmetric uh, Tim Bauer. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention. I hope you will enjoy the rest of the lectures for um, uh, this week. Again, many of them are going to be given. Uh, by uh, students in my group and um, postdocs in my group, and I thank them for um, uh, their um, uh, work preparing the presentations and also working you guys through these tutorials. And I hope you enjoy it, and please give us feedback at uh, the end in order to um, uh, let us know what we can improve uh, for uh, the next virtual or in-person workshop that is coming. And uh, with this, I would like to, uh, again, thank you for your attention and uh, enjoy the rest of the show.